And Dave Sussman back with you for America's Voice News, and I'm delighted to be here at Caltech uh, for an interview that we've been very excited about with Mr. George Gilder, or an honorary doctor, George Gilder, uh, is an influential writer, an economist, uh, an investor, and uh, co-founder of the Discover Institute, and uh, an author of 19 books, including the best-selling Wealth and Poverty, which made him Ronald Reagan's most quoted living author. Uh, Mr. Gilder's latest book is Life After Google, which just the title alone opens up so many questions people can't conceive. Uh, thank you so much for, for having us. I'm delighted to be here. Before we get into Life After Google, in 1981, you wrote the best-selling uh, New York Times bestseller. Uh, uh, when we talk about wealth and poverty, it was what many people consider the guide to capitalism. And uh, as mentioned, Ronald Reagan loved this book. I cut my teeth on this book from the standpoint of learning about economics. What do you say to those people that are deeply concerned about this upward uh, thrust that we're seeing from many in politics today towards socialism? Well, uh, I just think it's wrong. And uh, however, it's understandable. I mean, the, I believe that capitalism suffers from a, grave flaw today, and that is floating currencies. And uh, in 1971, Richard Nixon left the gold standard. And ever since then, money hasn't been truly money, because money uh, has become a kind of magic wand for central banks, a kind of tool of sovereign policy. But real money is a measuring stick. It's a guide for entrepreneurial creativity. And, uh, and so uh, the crisis of 2008, when uh, the whole world financial system virtually collapsed, uh, was a serious signal of the failure of the existing forms of money and the need for a new, new uh, system of global money where money can be a measuring stick again rather than a magic wand of politics and I, politicians. That, that comes to a place that I'd like to take this interview in a little bit, not get into it in too much detail, but you are a fan of cryptocurrency. You see that as the equalizer to this? I, I, I believe that cryptocurrencies are what Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to call a unity, a, a single policy that can address a whole array of fundamental problems or and, and uh, the two big problems I see in the world economy are the collapse of internet security. Uh, there were a billion breaches of uh, security on the internet last year. After a decade of steadily, massively expanding expenditures on computer security, so the more we spend on computer security, the more hacks and breaches are. That suggests there's a fundamental problem of, com of internet architecture. Security isn't a video game, it's a, an architecture. And the response to that is a new architecture for the internet based on blockchain and related cryptographic currencies. At the same time, the other world crisis is of floating currencies, where the biggest industry in the world economy is currency trading. $5.1 trillion a day of currency trading, and which doesn't even arrive at currency values that, that don't require entrepreneurs who trade across borders to hedge all their transactions. And, uh, as, and uh, central banks have responded to this crisis uh, uh, by issuing more and more money. And the 
more money under the new monetary policy that gets issued, uh, the slower world economic growth becomes, and the more uh, the, econ the world economy is afflicted with trade wars and suspicions and conflicts and stagnation and, and people calling for socialism. What, what, not to interject, but I just to uh, ask you about this, because when we go back to 2008, how much of that was a result on government interference? You talk about quantitative easing. You talk about interest rates. They repealed Glass-Steagall. Uh, they were backing securities and, and collateralized mortgage obligations. How much of 2008 was a direct reaction to the, 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 the regulatory state or government interference? I think it was all uh, uh, a reaction to it. And, but the fundamental thing is, is uh, having uh, zero interest rates, you know, having a policy that uh, obliterates the meaning of monetary signals. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if money is a tool of politicians, as it has been, who, uh, and then uh, financial arbitrage and transactions become the heart of the economy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that $5.1 trillion of currency trading is 25 times all world GDP. It's 75 times almost all world trade in goods and services. Uh, this is a, f a hypertrophy of finance, and it's the result of, uh, of, of really flo uh, having currencies float. And if money is a measuring stick, it has to be stable. It mm -hmm. has to be steady. And so the answer to this crisis is also the same answer as to the problem of Internet uh, security breakdowns, and that is uh, blockchain technologies that, uh, that once again attach money to a real immutable uh, ground state and uh, uh, resemble it, and, and they will succeed as money to the extent that they resemble gold. And I think um, there's going to be a move toward gold when the next financial crisis erupts. You talking about the internet, and I want to get very heavily into the book. Um, you refer to Silicon Valley. They seem to have adopted what you say can best be described as a neo-Marxist ideology, technological vision, uh, that they have, uh, they, they have created this definitive human achievement. But when you're talking about it from a standpoint of neo-Marxism, what are you referring to specifically there? Well, the, Google, for example, mm -hmm. uh, essentially, and many others in Silicon Valley, make the same error that Marx made. And Marx's key error was to regard all the innovations of the Industrial Revolution, the uh, steam engine, the mechanical looms, the uh, railroads, the beginnings of electricity, all the spate of innovations, Marx believed to be a kind of final Amer human achievement. In the future, we wouldn't have to worry about producing wealth. Uh, the only issue would be how we redistribute wealth. And uh, today, the Google people make the same kind of error. They say that um, the machine learning, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, big data, um, algorithmic biology, robotics, are a kind of final human achievement, an eschaton. Uh, and that in the future, we won't have to worry about creating wealth anymore. Uh, the whole issue will be redistributing wealth. And so the, many of the people in Silicon Valley are now advocating a universal um, national income yeah. uh, to take care of all the su suddenly obsolete human minds in the world. And while, uh, you know, 
Larry Page and Sergey Brin. We're going to get right, real deep into this. We're going to take a quick break okay. right here for our commercials, yeah. and we'll be right back with George Gilder, Dave Sussman yeah. here at America's Voice yeah. News. And Dave Sussman returning back with you at America's Voice News. And uh, if you haven't found our YouTube channel, check out Whiskey Politics. And also you can find us on the Ricochet Audio Network. And I'm delighted to be here at Caltech with George Gilder. And we're talking about Life After Google, which is one of the, it's, it's a book that I, there were certain chapters that I had to read more than a few times. Uh, it's a lot of information, but I understand, not that I didn't understand it, but I had to consider it. So, for example, we were just talking about this idea of Silicon Valley being some form of new neo-Marxist approach to things. And the, um, when we talk about Google, we're talking about not just search engines. We're talking about mail. We're talking about YouTube. We're talking about Google Maps. We're talking about uh, AI. The list goes on and on and on. It's ubiquitous. Okay, But one of the things is that you talk about in your book is that 95% of Google's ad revenue comes from search still okay so w- what are we looking at from the standpoint of what it is that they are trying to do with with you know um, machine learning and AI that's going to uh, somewhat diversify their portfolio if you will and actually making revenues elsewhere yeah well I, I think their dream of of artificial intelligence uh, attached to a kind of singularity mm-hmm. is another great error uh, they actually imagine that the human mind is essentially a computer and thus subject to obsolescence by the rise of machine minds uh, f- uh, connected with machine learning mm-hmm. uh, in their d- giant data warehouses. And, and I think this is an illusion. I'm, I've recently been... Uh, uh, studying this, uh, the human mind, and and the and I've, I've always been preoccupied with big numbers, like the Google people are. Well, yeah. the number that preoccupies me these days is the zettabyte. The zettabyte is ten to the twenty-first, or I thought pentabyte was big. I couldn't pe- consider yeah. that one. This is zettabyte. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about zettabyte is about as big as it gets, two to the three hundredth. It's uh, what does that mean, though? It, it's it's more than all the atoms in the universe. I mean, it's just it's just an absurdly big figure, a zettabyte. And that relates to what processing? Yeah, that that relates to the size of all the memories attached to the internet and the World Wide Web. And so it's data. T- yeah, it's data is now past a zettabyte. And uh, and at the same time, I've learned that in order to map a single human mind, the connectome, the connectome of the human mind, all the links among neurons in the human brain, uh, and axons and dendrites and synapses and spindle cells and uh, that to map the human connectome takes how much data do you think? <laughs> it's above my pay grade. How much? A zettabyte. <laughs> so, in, in other that's, words, but that's what you're t- to map the all the connections in the human brain takes as much memory almost as to as all the memory attached to the World Wide Web. So where does that come from? Where did that energy come from? Well, well let's, energy is the crucial point. The, that human brain, the zettabyte in the, of connections in the human brain, t- takes between 12 to 14 watts to run, maybe even less. It's, it's debatable, but just a few watts, not okay. as many as a light bulb. Well, all the memories on the internet, the zettabytes on the internet, take gigawatts, terawatts to run. So it means that the the zettabyte 
in our brains is billions of times more efficient than the connectome in our brains, than the connectome on the global internet. And so this whole idea that somehow uh, internet technology is gonna usurp human minds is just totally delusional. And yet it is a pervasive delusion in Silicon Valley. It's a pervasive delusion among brilliant men like Stephen Hawking, like Elon Musk. They all think that, that uh, you know, this computer AI right. is uh, like a nuclear bomb. It's gonna el eliminate, or a neutron bomb. It'll eliminate all the human beings and create a new machine culture. So and, you, you refer to Ray Kurzweil er earlier in the discussion, yeah. okay? Um, singularity, Renaissance man, yeah. incredible uh, uh, individual. I think he, Ray is just absolutely wonderful. Yes. Uh, but he's, and, and he uses the singularity as a tool of thinking. And uh, it's allowed him to organize all his knowledge about technology in a beautiful way in his book, The Singularity yes. is Near. It describes all the learning curves that are at the heart of um, my economic theory. Uh, but he's not right that in a specific way that uh, computers will eclipse human minds. That's just, and, and he really begins to understand it. I mean, he admits he doesn't understand what consciousness is. And if he Which doesn't is a big part of your book, by the way. If he it, doesn't understand what consciousness is, uh, he doesn't yeah. understand the human mind, even though he wrote a book about how to create a mind. So the idea that, I, uh, that behavior can be simulated by a machine, that if Ray Kurzweil says that machines uh, are going to become more, you know, smarter than individuals, you now have people at Google, coming back to your book here, uh, that are creating these, these, these models, if you will, um, AlphaGo. Alpha yeah. Go Zero. These things are learning on themselves yeah, yeah. every single day. Isn't there a point where they continue to they learn so much? I don't much? believe they're learning exactly. You don't think so? No, they're, they're processing data and, and finding patterns in data and uh, identifying anomalies. It's in a deterministic realm. That is, uh, but the world is not deterministic. The world is full of unexpected events. The world is full of surprises. And one of the great mistakes that Silicon Valley is currently making, as in their strategy for self-driving cars, for example, based on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, machine learning and artificial intelligence is, is uh, like driving your car by looking at the rear view mirror. You're likely to crash. Uh, this is not a remedy for dealing with all the surprising combinatorial explosions that you find in the real world. And so, it's, so it has consequences, this belief that the human brain is somehow a computer, so that if we make our computers fast enough and feed them enough data, they can eclipse brains. Uh, the human brain is fabulously uh, exponentially more powerful than any computer. And computers are still sets of physical gates and, and wires and switches, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't know anything and they can't learn anything. And you, you, so- You don't believe that emotional intelligence can be learned? Well, I, I, I think emotional intelligence is kind of a, a jargon, of the, formula that really springs from, from the idea that they're going to map the human brain uh, mm -hmm. with, with their zettabyte. And once they've mapped the connectome, uh, that they'll know anything about what, what the brain is actually doing or how it works. Uh, you know, computers themselves offer the best model. I mean, if you, if, if you knew every molecule in a computer chip you will, or in a computer system, you still would have no idea what the computer is doing unless you knew the source code supplied by the programmer. 
So if, if, if knowing where every gate and transistor and connection, the connectome of a computer mm -hmm. doesn't reveal anything about the computer's function, right. why do they imagine that knowing every molecule in the brain will allow you to um, reproduce human intelligence? Gotcha. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to continue right after the break with George Gilder, Dave Sussman here at America's Voice News. And welcome back, Dave Sussman here. We are still with George Gilder here at Caltech, and uh, we are talking life after Google. Uh, you refer to Bell's Law in the book, mm -hmm. and uh, Bell's Law, where you mentioned, along with Moore's Law, uh, and we were just talking before the break here that uh, I believe you were just speaking with the gentleman that created the idea of yeah, Moore's Law. Well, researched Moore's Law and named Moore's Law. Uh, that's, that's incredible. Um, so it, it, Harvard it, Mead is his name. Harvard Mead. So you talk about the, um, uh, the decade of processing speed increases as the price drops, right? The, the, the pro as, as the processing speed increases. So you're talking about the Zenobite, right? That's yeah. the processing speed that we have. Um, and I don't, I don't want to spend too much more time on this because there's so much more I want to cover on this, but going back to the idea of a singularity, where that point crosses where machines know as much as, uh, as the human mind, you don't feel that we are there. What it's do you- It's not, not whether we're there. Or, or, or that is computers, achievable? Computers know from some point of view vastly more than the human mind. Yeah. But we created the computers, we programmed the computers, we supplied the data to the computers, we created the machine learning uh, programs that allow the computers to gain a s semblance of autonomy. It's, it, to, to say that computers are learning or thinking is a misconception. They, they're deterministic machines that uh, are programmed by humans to perform particular functions. So it, it leads me to this question, because in your book, you, you, you talk about the model of free, yeah. all right? And the idea that you have to be incentivized and there has to be a value and the way that we show value in our world is through money, yeah. right? Uh, and so when you have free, which, you know, some people will say, well, it's not really free. I think you refer to this as well. It's your time. Mm -hmm. What is your time worth? So if I look mm -hmm. at an ad, that is putting a value on my time. Mm -hmm. But you also say that that has held back the technology from improving, from, from the standpoint of well, stifling it innovation. Makes, it makes Google vulnerable, I think. Well, what does I that mean? mean? I've spent, I've spent uh, a lot of the last couple months in China and I'm it, where my book was a bestseller for a while yes. in, in China, Life After Google. But, um, and, uh, and Google is very vulnerable to companies in China. Google and Facebook both get 90, between 95 and 99% of their income from advertising. And they give away most of their products for free in order to collect data. And that aggregate and advertise model, um, I think, is coming to the end of the line. Uh, people are rebelling against it. Uh, it's, uh, it's suffering from a security crisis. There are all sorts of ways that, uh, uh, that Google is vulnerable to Chinese companies. The Chinese Baidu and Tencent and and uh, Alibaba and uh, WeChat, which part of um, Tencent, these companies get 10 to 15 percent of their income from uh, ad, ad advertising. They, they actually know how to collect money from real customers by giving away their services for free Google both avoids liabilities to real customers that they have to serve and avoids the full burden of security because uh, if your good is given away for free, uh, there's less a burden of security. So while the Chinese co 
companies are masters of transactions and secure transactions, uh, the American companies are avoiding that discipline which is imparted by price signals and uh, makes them vulnerable. Meanwhile, uh, U.S. government is suing them from every which direction. I mean, Google's being sued by the Trump administration for sex discrimination of all, all things. And, and there are just all kinds of uh, SEC, the FTC, uh, you know, all the regulatory apparatus of yeah. Washington is now descending upon these big companies, which really are the heart of the U.S. economy. And Which is and, an, an interesting segue here for you, because first of all, about the lawsuits, I don't know if you saw the recent study, but Google thought that they were paying women less, and they did their own internal study, and it turned out that men were being paid less. No, I know. It's, it's, right. I, I, I could have predicted that 25 years ago, but that, it doesn't... Uh, Right. It's just a, it's just a funny anecdote. Yeah, but but the, fa the, the thing is, is that you, you talk about this as well. And that is that the, the economy is continually shifting and the leaders in the economy shift. So right now you have an Amazon or a Microsoft or, um, you know, Google, which are Apple, Apple. Right. And in 10 years from now, you could see four of those five of those largest companies in the world be Chinese companies. It could be. I mean, 10 years ago, the four top companies were Exxon, Mobil, Walmart. IBM? No, Exxon, Mobil, Walmart, Walmart, China Petroleum, okay. and China Industrial and Commercial Bank. Those were the four biggest uh, co companies in the world by market cap. Just 10 years later, uh, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon? and Amazon are the right. four biggest companies in the world. A couple of a trillion dollar market cap from time to time. So th this was an awesome achievement, and, uh, and these companies now are being attacked by the U.S. government as if they're monopolies. Elizabeth Warren seems to think that they rule the world, when in fact they, they have vulnerable business plans and are in danger of being eclipsed by Chinese companies. What did you think of the Microsoft ant antitrust suit in the 90s? I, I thought it was silly. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, that uh, it did make Microsoft a less efficient company. It, you know, they had to be preoccupied with lawyers. And, and I really think that uh, it doesn't help. Uh, the uh, antitrust is a very, uh, you know, there's, it's very hard to show a lot of benefits from breaking up these companies. And the lawsuits take decades, and by the time they come to a climax, the company's about to lose its edge. You know, IBM uh, was regarded to be a completely dominant company, and uh, the U.S. sued it for decades. And finally, when just as it was becoming almost irrelevant or, or a much less significant force, uh, the suit came to a climax. It, it's it, it, this whole circus of litigation is just n not either effective, uh, except in distracting and stultifying leading companies in the U.S. economy. And 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 we don't, people don't understand the full power of of the model of socialized capitalism that the Chinese uh, have, are pursuing. They, 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 are, they uh, don't allow political freedom, but they sponsor tremendous efflorescence of creativity in uh, company formation and venture capital. They have three times more initial public offerings than we have. Uh, there are private companies. But there's no P IPOs right now. No, their private companies yeah. are growing so much uh, faster than their government that their government is now down to around 17 percent of GDP. It's it's expanded recently, I okay. believe. But the last measure was, which is about half of the U.S. But, government. I mean, we we really have to understand that this is a serious uh, economic. Uh, uh, 
competition in the world, and it, it has wonderful horizons, but, but to uh, bring in the government to impose tariffs on Chinese competitors and, and sue American companies for antitrust and, and impose new taxes on successful entrepreneurs, preventing them from reinvesting their money. Uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, uh, a false model. Right. I want to go into a lot more of this right after the break, our last break here with George Gilder at Caltech, Life After Google. And we're going to be talking about that life after Google right after the break. And Dave Sussman, back with you at America's Voice News, and uh, we are with George Gilder, author of Life After Google, plus 18 other books. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> 20, maybe 19, I don't know. You got another one on the way? Yep. Um, Where can um, folks find you, by the way? Um, well, I'm, I'm about to launch four newsletters and, and a daily commentary and a whole new company and uh, to guide investment in this world of life after Google. It's, it's really a treacherous environment, but there are huge opportunities, and I hope to, to open up some of these opportunities. Terrific. Is there a website? Or a place there will be. Uh, will well, be. But www.gildertech.com and discovery.org is uh, Discovery Institute. And, uh, but, okay. But I, but I think uh, people will be informed about my new ventures that will be launched over the next few months. It seems like everything you touch, uh, you, I mean, you, you wrote a book, Life After Television, yeah. right? And some time ago, and, and if you read this book, folks, it, it is, uh, you're, you're right in there. I mean, I cut the cord four or five years ago, mm -hmm. right? I, and I, everything is through streaming, mm -hmm. and I choose mm -hmm. where I want to go. Yeah. I'm not yeah. waiting for them yeah. to tell me. This is yeah. what your book predicted. Yeah. Yeah. It also predicted that the, Computer of the future would be as on the watch. Port portable as your watch, yep. as personal as your wallet. It would recognize speech. It would navigate streets. It would collect your news and your mail. Which is it where just we might not do windows. It might not do windows, but it's where we are right now. But one of the biggest questions that people are having about all of this access to information mm -hmm. is privacy, yeah. and it's one of the biggest concerns that I think a lot of us have regarding. You know, we understand the Internet of Things. We understand free that we have to give a, a certain price, which is a little bit of us. It's our data. Uh, but when you talk about Facebook and when you're talking about Amazon, you, you talk about you refer to Amazon as a walled off garden, right? Where where it's it, they have kind of done what they wanted to do yeah. with privacy. Can you talk about the threats to privacy and uh, what you see for that with, with the future here? Well, I have a slightly different view than many people do. I think privacy in terms of your control of your own identity and your control of your data and uh, your ability to s sell it to people who want to buy it, um, are, are really important. The view that privacy somehow consists of being able to cancel your presence on the net and uh, you know, the right to be forgotten or whatever, uh, no one has a right to be forgotten. Uh, the world doesn't offer that possibility. And to the kind of regulations that the Europeans yeah. are inflicting on uh, American companies really out of envy of their success and, and, uh, and in pursuit of huge fees and penalties, I think is wrong. I, I believe um, that uh, the world is dangerous and it's possible to have nuclear weapons in cities, it's possible to have bio weapons in airports or whatever, and that uh, the kind of privacy where we all disappear and uh, can't be tracked or identified by our faces in airports and other such places, I think is gone. And, and I don't regret it. Uh, I think that uh, the real 
violation of privacy is when the policeman comes to your door and breaks into your house and takes your computer or whatever. That, that's a real threat. And I think that the new cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. are... This the, is your antidote. Yeah. The this big... Blockchain. The, the big uh, remedy for these problems is the blockchain. And, and it creates money that's better than cash because uh, uh, Bitcoin and, and imitative yeah. not only uh, allow you some form of anonymity, you don't have to, uh, and, and you don't have to identify yourself and strip yourself naked before the camera in order to qualify for a transaction at any of the thousands of possible sites you may visit. Uh, the, it, uh, so it gives you anonymity from that point of view, but at the same time, it also gives you attestation. You, it, you can prove to the government or the cop or, or the corporate um, litigator or whatever precisely what you did do, where you spent your money, uh, where you went. Uh, because uh, the blockchain will offer an immutable database. So, so it combines anonymity of cash with attestation, but it doesn't allow the terrorist or the criminal or whatever to hide very long because, because actually what it means is all information is much more securely and permanently stored so I, and, I think and people, ava available. Uh, regarding blockchain, because we talk about life after Google, this yeah. is life after Google. This, yeah. is, this is what you're looking at here. So I really want to understand this. And, and, and again, I'm somewhat of a layman when it yeah. comes to understanding this. I yeah. think most people, they know Bitcoin and, okay, you got to put in this code and it's worth a certain amount and it's, 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 it's now also being used uh, as, as, uh, as an investment potential for mm -hmm. people. But um, blockchain, is, is, that's the platform, correct? Yeah, that's correct? the platform. So that's, the, that's a new architecture for the Internet, which um, today the Internet is top-down. In other words, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Tencent, Alibaba, whatever the company is, um, sets the terms of your entrance into activities in the on the on the online and uh, so the so it's it's a top-down internet the new blockchain means that each individual has one identity which all the top-down companies have to respect and uh, and address and uh, you you it's it's you have your private key in the same way you have your own DNA. It's uh, it means that the ultimate ruler is not the Leviathan internet player. It's the individual on the net. So when we, when we talk about today's internet, some people referred it to as Internet 2.0, where you're actually participating in conversation. Internet 1.0 is you post something and that's it. You're talking about something that is fundamentally different as a platform. Blockchain is a platform. But what does that look like for transactions, for example? Is it still the visual that we see on an internet, an Amazon, you click on something? Well, well, on a Amazon, you click on something, and and uh, they control that walled garden where you function, and you have to uh, defer to all the terms specified by Amazon. Uh, in the future, uh, it'll be a user-centric internet, and uh, and uh, the internet will allow you to establish facts and to conduct transactions, to store crucial information immutably. It, it uh, creates a new platform for trust uh, across uh, the world economy. And, 
and that is uh, that both more secure and uh, and and uh, more private from some from from the point of view of having private control of your identity and and data. So you refer in the book something, uh, and, and I'm paraphrasing, tell me if I'm wrong here, you refer to smart contracts, yeah. okay? So ag again, I guess I'm trying to whittle it down. Well, smart contracts are a, are a, are a way of, uh, of raising money on the internet today. I mean, uh, we have no IPOs. We have this IPO crisis. Where have they gone? All right. Well, they've gone to ICOs. That's initial coin offering. Right. And in the last 12 months, a platform called Ethereum yeah. has allowed uh, small companies to raise some $25 billion, startups to raise some $25 billion through a smart contract of an initial coin offering. And, and this has really redressed the IPO crisis in the United States. It's, it's the first big contribution made uh, by cryptocurrencies. And, has uh, there been a transfer of capital then from Wall Street into this? Yes, yes. This is, this is mainly funded by profits from the Bitcoin boom, uh, transferred to uh, various cryptocurrencies and around the world. And, and they've okay. created a huge new realm of fundraising for entrepreneurs. And that, that's the first big uh, accomplishment of... Um, so, how, of uh, so, so go, go back to blockchain. blockchain. Yeah, so go, going back to blockchain, and I have two questions for you, because the, one of the concerns that you have that you raise in life after Google is centralization, yeah. right? And everything is centralized, much in the way that uh, you, we, we started out talking about socialism, that's what they want, yeah. centralized government. Yeah. So centralized internet, this will disperse that centralization. It will yeah. be decentralizing That's it. Right. But again, my question comes back to you real quickly. From a user interface, most of our viewers are, are, are going to be scratching their heads yeah. a little bit. I am, right? From a, from a practical user interface, how will I be using blockchain differently than I use the internet now? Well, you, you'll just, you won't have to know of hundreds of different usernames and passwords and dates of birth and last four numbers of your social security number and all the endless uh, hassles that you face moving around the internet and doing transactions on it. Instead, uh, you will have one identity and all the people who want to sell things to you on the internet will have to speak in that language. They'll use your public key and you'll use your private key and uh, you'll be able to both protect your identity and data while at the same time transacting anywhere on the internet. So the life after Google isn't so much a change of the user interface or the experience or, or what you may see on your laptop or your phone. Well, I think, well. But it's more about confidentiality? No, it's, it's, about, it's, it's, it's about ending the internet as a global copying machine where there's no facts can be trusted, where uh, uh, anything is endlessly mutable, uh, where individuals are really tools of giant uh, internet companies. It's uh, it, an economy where, uh, where every f data is vulnerable to hacking and distortion and manipulation. An economy where money means nothing across the world economy. It's a tool of sovereign governments and politicians. It's, it's really a new monetary regime combined with a new internet architecture. Uh, and uh, it, I think it can offer a new path to prosperity. The current path we're on is to another and succession of ever more violent world uh, uh, financial crashes and trade wars and, and, and suspicions and conflicts. And I think that uh, we need to get out of that. And, and the path out of it is, 
is, uh, is defined by the cryptocosm, I the hear, holy array of creativity. Yeah. I hear a lot of optimism there. And yeah. uh, in our last few seconds here, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us. And, uh, you know, what you are doing is so important for people to think and consider because it's never going to stay static where we yeah. are right now. Yeah. It's always, there's always a trajectory taking us to a different place. And uh, boy, oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And I'm looking forward to, to uh, learning more about what you're doing. So thank you so much, uh, George Gilder, and uh, we'll be back again next time with another amazing interview here at America's Voice News. I'm Dave Sussman. Very special thanks to George Gilder here at Caltech, and we'll be back again soon. Cheers.